All right, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Nicola from Culpepper. Rachel Winter is also helping me from Headwaters. And we're gonna moderate the chat. Sammy is our presenter and he's gonna present and um, where Rachel and I are gonna moderate the chat box. If you have a question, make sure you, when you put it in the box, you put it to everyone so that uh, we can all, so that Rachel and I could see it and we can um, ask him if appropriately in the middle of the presentation or hold it till the end or perhaps answer you um, without interrupting Sammy. So uh, that's how it's gonna work. And so I have a bio for him. Sammy Zambone is the visitor experience specialist for Virginia State Parks. He has been a ranger for almost 20 years when not rangering I guess that is a word. Um, Rangering Sammy spends time canoeing, kayaking, and photographing wildlife. This is his first time working with the Envirothon training, and I told him how much he would love it. So let's uh, keep him to that. So Sammy, I think I can, you're a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen if you have a PowerPoint, and I'm, and we can take it away. All right, welcome everybody. Um, so I am Sammy Zambone. I'm the visitor experience specialist for the eastern half of Virginia. Uh, prior to uh, working in our central office and spending most of my time designing signs and uh, exhibits for, for our visitor centers at state parks and teaching our guides and um, our naturalists and historians, uh, I studied forestry, uh, focusing on forest ecology and managing forests for wildlife. And in the 14 years I spent as a chief ranger, I spent a lot of time managing our parks for wildlife and uh, for human recreational activity. Uh, so uh, it is my first time uh, working with the Envirothon team. And one of my first times actually presenting on Zoom. So forgive me if I have some uh, technical issues. Uh, I see somebody in our chat had a cat on the board. Uh, my last time on Zoom, my hound dog decided to bay, so my presentation was interrupted by a dog going, Barrr! <laughs> nice and loud. Um, so you can call me Ranger Sam, that'd be easier. Uh, my last name is Zambone, which sounds like ham bone, if you want to toss that one in there. Uh, and let me start out with, does anybody have any burning wildlife questions? They can either type it in the chat or you can unmute. Giving everybody that second to get there. I don't see any raised hands. And I don't see any questions in the chat. So, um, Let me start out with a question for y'all. Um, let's see. This is one off of one of the previous tests. I'm gonna give you the uh, definition and somebody, ah, what are the general topics and that we need to know? Okay, I'll get to that in just a second. So somebody, I'm gonna, somebody type in the chat the response community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of their environment, things like air, water, and mineral, interacting as a system is the definition for what? Ecosystem, very good. So I'll try to toss some, of, uh, toss some of those questions from previous tests in there to kind of get you going a little bit. So I'm gonna start with my presentation. I can remember how to share, there we go. We see this in presentation mode. You're good. Okay. Can anybody identify the uh, the mammal species we have in that photo? And I can't see the chat anymore, so 
You have some dolphins coming in there, Sammy. Yes, that's a common dolphin. Different than our bottlenose dolphin. So key in Viarathon wildlife topics, you're gonna to need to know, uh, you're gonna to have to have uh, knowledge of your wild birds, mammals, and uh, some basics of wildlife ecology, conservation and management of wildlife, and then issues involving wildlife and society. So hopefully the knowledge of birds, mammals, and herbs is best done when you're out in the field or if you're at a facility that's got a whole bunch of um, skins and skulls for you to look at, doing it over Zoom is not quite so easy. I do, I, I put together a video that should be available um, to you all that covered some of the basics of skins and skulls for mammals. And I went a little bit into a couple of birds that I had access to. Um, so hopefully that will help there. Um, so here's a little bit of how you're going to be able to identify them when it comes to your competition. Uh, mounted specimens, skins, pelts, skulls, scat. That's what we all leave behind. Um, tracks. Uh, then with birds, you know, decoys, wings, uh, songs. All about birds is a good one. There's lots of resources on the web. Um, herps, including uh, your, your aquatic and your terrestrial, your, your frogs, your salamanders, uh, your, your reptiles. Uh, there's lots of different resources out there. And let me give you one for, and a copy a link into the, uh, the chat for y'all. That's a really good resource for uh, the snakes of Virginia. So you can copy that and paste it or just drop it into a link. Um, are they gonna have access to the chat afterwards? Yes, we're gonna be saving the chat. Okay. So that'll, that'll give you um, Back to uh, snake ID? Yes, you're good. Okay. So uh, one of the things you really have to remember is frequently we hear people calling snakes poisonous and non-poisonous. And that's actually, uh, that's incorrect. Even on this graphic, it's actually showing poisonous and non-poisonous snakes. Um, that should be venomous and non-venomous um, because a poison is a contact. Um, so think of poison ivy versus venom from like a snake or a spider uh, is injected versus through your skin. Um, and when you're looking at some of your different snakes, the way to tell um, the difference between them is a venomous snake is gonna have a triangular shaped head. Um, their eyes are gonna be elliptical, um, more like a cat's eye versus a round pupil. Uh, and then if you're looking down at the anal plate on the tail, so on the underside of the snake, uh, a venomous snake is gonna have a single set of scales versus double set of scales a non-venomous snake is gonna have. So what three venomous species of snakes do we have here in Virginia and how far across the state can you find them? All right, some answers are coming into the chat box. We are seeing cottonmouth, copperhead, eastern cottonmouth, copperheads, copperheads, rattlesnake. 
Good. Um, so we've got copperheads, which are found everywhere across the state. Timber rattlesnakes, which you can find in the mountains, so the ridge, um, and then the Appalachians. And then you can also find it down around the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, there's a subspecies called the canebrake rattlesnake. Uh, and then you can find the cottonmouth along the, uh, the wetter area, the southeastern portion of the state. So really the one we find, uh, I live in the Fredericksburg area, the one that I typically come across is the copperhead. But I know some of you are in other regions of the state, so you can find different species. Uh, so our top snake, is it a uh, venomous or non-venomous? Does anybody know what species that is? We're getting non-venomous so far. Okay, good. I do not see anybody guessing the species. Here it comes, corn snake, question mark. Yes, that is correct. It's a corn snake. Uh, and then the bottom species is a copperhead. And one of the other snakes that we find commonly throughout Virginia, uh, frequently confused with our copperhead, is this little guy. Uh, and that is a juvenile black rat snake. Uh, particularly when copperheads are uh, very young, uh, they're very easily confused with the juvenile black rat snakes. Uh, one of the ways you can tell the copperhead apart besides the shape of the head and the pupil, because I don't think you want to get that close to the copperhead to see that it's got a snake eye or it's got a uh, cat's eye pupil, um, but juvenile copperheads have a bright yellow tail. Uh, while the juvenile black rat snakes do not. So moving into some general knowledge, uh, one of the things you're gonna probably need to know is to break down uh, and identify species uh, through classification. And you can use a mnemonic it's preferred candy over fried green spinach uh, is one of them. I've seen some other ones. And what's the K going to stand for? Let's see. We have kingdom. Yep. Where's our P? Phylum. Uh, and we want to go for C? Class. Good. O. Order. Yep. F, family good. Family, yep. Genus and, and species. Excellent. That is exactly right. So using a tool like this mnemonic, that'll be a helpful way to remember these. Uh, there's three domains and then six species. I'm sorry six kingdoms um, and most of the ones we're going to be dealing with are going to be in the eukarya which means uh, their organelles are inside of sacs. So if we were to classify this northern bobwhite it's in the animalia it's in the chordata meaning it has the spinal cord aves because it's a bird Galliformes. I'm not even going to try that last one on family. Um, my Latin's a little rusty. Uh, genus, uh, Linus, and then species of Virginianus. Uh, important to know with your nomenclature, genus is capitalized, species is not. Um, and that's important because if you capitalize them both, it's wrong. Uh, so why do we use Latin? Uh, we use Latin because it's universal. Um, everybody knows a bobwhite quail is Colinus virginianus. Uh, I can't remember what the Latin name is for a great blue heron right now. And most people would know a bird, uh, that particular bird as a great blue heron. I think 
probably most of you have seen one around a wetland, tall wading bird, kind of gray, blue color. Um, somebody I used to work with referred to that as a tom crane. It's not a crane. Um, I don't know if it was actually named Tom or not, uh, but in any case, uh, so I knew it as a great blue heron, he knew it as a tom crane, uh, but both of us should have known what the Latin name of it was. Tracks, there's some really good guides for tracks out there. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Um, skulls, you are what you eat. And skulls, I really find fascinating. And I've spent a lot of time on that video through them. Um, Dentition's really important when you're looking at it because it'll help you to identify whether or not you've got an omnivore, which eats a wide variety of both plants and meat. Uh, an herbivore, which uh, focuses its, um, its diet on plants and then carnivore, which focuses its diet on meat. Uh, omnivores are gonna have the widest variety of teeth uh, because they've got the widest variety of food that they eat. Herbivores and carnivores are going to have a reduced number of teeth and it's going to be specialized for their diets. Uh, so when you get studying your skulls, really take a close look at the teeth. Uh, what mammal in Virginia has the highest number of teeth? Yes. Um, we are uh, seeing shark, bobcat, opossum. Possum. There you go. So our shark is not a is not a mammal. It's not warm blooded. It doesn't uh, have hair. It doesn't uh, provide milk for its young, and its ear bones uh, has a different number of ear bones. Um, but bobcats a good guess. But bobcats are. Um, they're true carnivores, and so they actually have a reduced number of teeth. Uh, but the possum is our little trash can. Um, they are scavengers, they're omnivores, and they have 50 teeth, um, more than any other mammal in North America. Before you move on, um, Ranger Sam, there is a question related to our species names. If you would use the, the full species name together that includes both the genus and the species. Yes, genus and species. Um, and sometimes you have subspecies. Um, so American bison is uh, bison, I'll say it's bison, bison, bison. I think it's all the <laughs> genus, species, and subspecies um, because there's a difference between woodland bison and plant bison. Uh, so they're different subspecies. Um, Somebody's got their mic on. And <laughs> yes, but that is, the, that is the only question I see in the chat box right now, so. Okay, so if anybody else has got a question, go ahead and ask away. Um, daily cycles, diurnal, nocturnal, uh, whether or not you're seeing them during the day, whether or not you're seeing them in the evening. Um, or at night, and then crepuscular is usually active at, around the dawn and at dusk. Um, one of our big crepuscular species, white-tailed deer, most active in the mornings and in the evenings. Um, you can also tell comparative body size looking at the different skulls. I will say in the video that I put together, the bear skull I had was only about, or was pretty small. Um, a little bit bigger than a softball, and that was because it came from a cub. So here's some key terms, and we're going to go through some of these um, and kind of see what we can come up with. I should have asked the, what's the four key components of habitat, uh, which is obviously right on your screen right now. Uh, so adequate food, 
water, shelter, and space. Uh, that's an area. The video I put together for you showed a, a man-made wetland. And we talked about, I, I talked a little bit about it being habitat for uh, the Eastern spotted newt. Ranger Sam, if you, we had a couple of questions that before you move on to habitat, while you have the skull, um, since that's a big portion, uh, the skull slide, they had a couple of questions about the skull. Would you like to answer them now or would you like to wait till the end? Um, actually, I can, I can answer the question in saying uh, this one, honestly. I honestly don't know how you can tell the cycle um, when an animal is active based on the skull. Uh, the looking at the eyes is a fairly good indicator of um, when they're active, but it also depends on whether or not that animal relies primarily on its eyesight for um, finding its food. Uh, when you look at the skull of a possum, skull uh, possums are typically active at night, but they don't rely a whole lot on their eyesight. Uh, and they have very small beady eyes versus a white-tailed deer, um, which is active mostly in the morning and in the evening, and they've got rather large eyes. So I honestly, that's something we'll have to, we'll have to look up. So uh, Red Fox, you know, is looking at a couple of different, uh, Habitats, if you were to look at a red fox, it's going through a diverse habitat, open fields, woodland, um, farmland, you can kind of find them all over the place. And uh, then gray fox focus mostly on upland woods and then more of a swampy area. Does anybody know which one of these species is capable of climbing trees? We have gray fox coming in. Gray fox, that's exactly right. And that's actually partially why we have red foxes in Virginia. Um, our native red fox in North America is actually out towards the west. The red fox species we have here was brought over by Europeans who like the fox hunt because our native gray fox uh, during a hunt would run up a tree and it's not much of a challenge to shoot a fox out of a tree. Um, they, there was no real sport to it. So uh, the Europeans brought in the red fox that was common to um, England and introduced them here. Uh, the Western red fox came across the land bridge. So let's answer that question. Why are cover and shelter needed? Anybody want to answer that? Madeline is saying raising young. Raising Anya says protection. Very good. Um, those are both good reasons. Protection. Warmth is another one that came in. Uh, yeah, that's why we're inside today for the most part, although I saw one or two people that were sitting out in the car um, doing that. Uh, but that's exactly right. Protection from predators and protection from the elements. So how, how are our wildlife uh, finding water? Another key ingredient for life. Where would you look for water? Stream, streams and rivers are the common answer coming in. Some are saying ponds as well. Lakes, good. What about puddles? Creeks, yeah. Um, so free water is what we've been talking about. Puddles do, getting, getting the, the water right off the grass and the plants around them lakes, ponds, uh, getting vegetation. Uh, so they're getting water from the vegetation that they're eating. 
I don't know if any of you have ever seen jewel weed, which is a small plant that has little orange flowers on it when it's in bloom. Um, but if you ever ever hit jewel weed with a weed whacker, you'd understand why any animal that eats jewel weed would uh, get quite a bit of water because it's mostly water. Um, and then metabolic water. And that's, uh, that's produced inside the body from uh, metabolic processes. Home range is kind of the area where an animal lives. Uh, this picture up here, you can see the, the, the black outline is the person's property. The yellow circles on there represent the home range of a white-tailed deer. Um, actually, it's deer, um, it's bucks that were being monitored. And you can see that there's a whole lot of overlap. Uh, well, for wildlife, yeah, I, I'm answering the question as to why is oxygen um, not air listed as a habitat requirement. There are environments that uh, are very anaerobic, and that's the right word, uh, where they lack oxygen. And we still have food chains there. Um, they're usually uh, set up through chemosynthesis. So while the wildlife species we deal with all rely on oxygen, um, not everything living does. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, so knowing an animal's home range is really important for when you're trying to count wildlife uh, populations. Um, especially it's used a lot with our larger predators and our larger mammals that cover large areas of land so that we know how many there are, we don't get false counts. Um, but also when you're thinking about management is uh, where that animal is at different times of the year. Uh, if you're managing for, uh, uh, let's say you're managing for snow geese that migrate back and forth, uh, you know, most of your work might be done in the spring, but your birds are actually there in the winter in this area. Um, and so you have to time your, uh, time your activities for wildlife management based on the needs of the animal that you're trying to manage for. Um, so in this area, we may be breeding habitat for some birds that come up from the south, but in the fall, they move further south. They might go to Florida, they might go down to South America, but we then become the wintering habitat for another set of birds that spend their summer up in the Arctic. Uh, Flyways are kind of important to know. Uh, we have several major pathways through Virginia. We're on the Atlantic Flyway, which is this blue in the picture. Uh, and you can see that kind of branches once you get north of us, it kind of funnels through Virginia. And if you think about a map of Virginia, you can think the flyways are like Route 81 running north south through the Blue Ridge, uh, through the Shenandoah Valley, down through the Great Valley of uh, 95, and then out on the Eastern Shore. Um, so we kind of have funnels. Uh, a lot of birds follow the Eastern Shore and cross the Chesapeake Bay down near Virginia Beach. Um, others cross down near the end of the Northern Neck because they come through Maryland to Point Lookout and then come across. Uh, others follow the Blue Ridge Mountains, and others follow the Shenandoah and Great Valley of Virginia. So localized habitats uh, are microhabitats. Uh, one of the best examples I can give you on that one are cave salamanders here in Virginia, uh, where they're reliant on uh, access to water inside the cave environments. And so they're really a, kind of a 
very limited distribution and you may have a cave salamander or um, an insect, uh, some of the isopods that are only found in a certain number of caves, uh, say along the Blue Ridge. And, and they can be very sensitive to disturbance. We had an incident in a cave a few years ago where somebody on a cave tour was, excuse the disgusting habit, was chewing tobacco and they spit into a cave pool. Just that little bit of tobacco introduced into that environment actually killed all the salamanders and all the eggs that were in that pool. Um, and that, that's how sensitive some of these wildlife species can be. Uh, these microhabitats, they give just enough relief to an animal to get out of a harsh habitat that they can survive. Uh, limiting factors. Uh, so some of these things, limiting factor is the factors that a population from continuously growing. Uh, exponentially and just overrunning an area. And they can be disease and parasites, uh, the number of females that are available for breeding, uh, the concentration of predation uh, on a particular population. And remember, we are predators. Uh, predation can include things like, uh, typically we think of, you know, a wolf on a bison or taking a moose uh, or, you know, a hawk on a snake, uh, but our cars removing members of a population is techn technically a form of predation. Uh, it's a form of mortality. And then uh, starvation is another thing. It's the limit of the amount of food. Uh, one of the real, one of the uh, situations I've seen is uh, changes in population of white-tailed deer, particularly due to disease. Uh, Virginia has a uh, kind of an endemic disease here called uh, hemorrhagic disease that affects the white-tailed deer population. And so the numbers will go up on white-tailed deer, they'll get very dense in a piece of property, and then there'll be an outbreak of hemorrhagic disease, uh, which causes a very high fever in the deer and that'll result in a lot of mortality and the numbers will go down and it'll take a few years for the population to come back. Population dynamics, uh, you can think about this in two ways. Uh, it's the interaction within a population. Uh, it's their birth rate, their mortality rate, um, the number and age structure of a population, it's also the study of those things. How are we doing on time? Time's going fast. Uh, carrying capacity is how many of a species an environment can sustain. And you can see on this graph the uh, the K, which is, is, you define it as K, is the carrying capacity. You'll see that there's oscillations up above it. You know, a population will do really well, and then there'll be a disease or there'll be starvation, and it drops below K. The environment has time to recover. The population comes back. Uh, but K is the average of those oscillations. The niche, the niche. Uh, it's a unique position that, a wild, that wildlife has or a particular species has um, in its physical area. It's kind of where things fit in, uh, where they've specialized to take advantage of uh, all their assets and where they can uh, outcompete their competitors. So uh, you may look at a tree and you may find that some species sit on the outside branches, some species um, sit on the inner parts of the tree, other species use the top, some are down closer to the ground. 
Uh, and over time that can lead to uh, species differentiating enough where they have um, anatomical or physiological um, or behavioral adaptations that allow them to take advantage of those situations. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Uh, in England, there's a butterfly and the butterfly is adapted. I, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's actually, it's a moth. Uh, the, butter, the moth is adapted to hide from predators against uh, a tree bark. So it, it's camouflaged that way. And they found that the trees closest to uh, some of the factories over time, the bark changed color and that was no longer a good adaptation because uh, those moths actually stuck out and predators were able to find them a little more readily. But the ones that survived uh, had a darker body color and eventually they became the dominant uh, expression of that. And so uh, they actually were able to fill that, that niche. Ranger Sam, before you move on from niche, there is a question from Zeke about what, can you give an example of what to include when we describe an organism's niche? For example, do we include things such as their diet, position to the, in the food chain, um, the role in constructing their environment, et cetera? Um, I would include all of those um, because depending on how you're describing what animal, it may be a uh, that where they're in the food chain is a diet um, and honestly I don't know how to answer that question beyond that is yes I would include those things in there um, hopefully that helped you with that answer and for the beginning folks it's an excellent question and, and Ranger Sam is right uh, include as much information as you can when you're answering questions like this because it will show your overall grasp of the concept and often this year is a little different because everything's online but in the long-term envirothon view um, often questions have partial credit answers and it's important to show your breadth of understanding of a concept like this niche is a big concept that includes everything I mean when you think about your own niche in the world it includes more than just your species so um, it's, it's, it's a great point though, but thank you for the question, Zeke. That was a very good question. It, it really is. Uh, think about what makes that animal fit in and it can, it can include, uh, you know, in, into what makes that animal fit into that environment. Um, and, you know, a uh, good example is, uh, timber doodles, uh, Trying to think what the other common name for a timber doodle is. Uh, oh, it's one isn't of it American woodcock? Yes, thank you. <laughs> woodcock. Um, they they fit it. They're a ground nesting bird, uh, so and they are definitely on the prey end of species. But they have a long beak, uh, good for probing, looking for worms, looking for their food. Uh, they have eyes that are out to the side that help them for movement, uh, looking, watching for predators. They have camouflage in their uh, feathers that help them blend into the, uh, the leaf litter on the ground. See, Charlie has a question. If more than one answer is possible to explain the answer on the side of the test. Um, that might be for this year structurally, I just kind of thinking since it will be an electronic test, that would be something I would suggest you and your team discuss before filling in the correct answer that you want to submit. But on a normal test that's written, handwritten, um, that's, I mean, to me, that's gonna be up to the judge. And I don't think, you'd wanna make sure that your correct answer is within the lines of your test. Um, and make sure you've got a definitive answer. Um, Steph and Sammy, if you have any other comments, throw those in there, but that's kind of how I would see. Yeah, I would agree with Rachel that 
yes, you can um, always explain more um, if you feel you don't have enough space. But um, in this this year, yeah, it's going to be all class marker is all multiple choice. So that's not really as much of an issue this year. But in the broad spectrum of Envirothon, you would uh, use as much space as you can. Just don't overly spend too much time on one question because there is a whole test and often people don't, uh, if you get bogged down in one question, you can always go back to that to add more information as far as time management skills go. But yes, uh, it's certainly possible. So um, going back to a couple of uh, these things, generalist versus specialist, uh, generalists go through a wide variety of habitats, wide variety of food sources. Uh, think about a black bear, we can find them across the Commonwealth. Um, our northern flying squirrel, uh, we can only find in certain regions. They're tied uh, pretty closely to the habitat of conifers and uh, mixed conifer stands and outside of the outside of the mountains we don't find them. Uh, there's another species of flying squirrel we find around the state. Uh, predator prey dynamics. Uh, that's how they interact. Lynx and hare are probably one of the biggest examples. Um, you can watch as the for snowshoe hares comes up, the lynx comes up, uh, more predation on the hare, it brings it down and then there's not as much food so the lynx follows it. Um, but usually uh, the change first is in the prey species uh, and then the, uh, the predator species follows behind. Keystone species. Uh, this is actually going to be one of the big ones. Uh, in Virginia. Uh, is, keystone species are ones that have major effects on their environment and a lot of other animals uh, and plants depend on them. Beaver is a huge one in Virginia uh, because they'll find moving water, they'll create a dam, uh, they'll back that up and flood an area which kills off the trees and then you get all sorts of wildlife that start using that. Frogs, salamanders, uh, waterfowl will start using that area. Eventually, uh, what happens is that dam, you know, the, the beavers will exhaust their food source, they'll move on. Uh, that dam will eventually wear out and break. Uh, and then that area is basically grassland and then bushes will move in, shrubs will move in. Uh, trees will eventually move in, so it sets back the successional stages in the environment. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, which one is which? A group of interdependent plants and animals inhabiting the same region and interacting with each other through food and other relationships is a definition of We have community coming in. Yep, community. All the individuals of one species in the given area is a population, and then we've already covered the ecosystem one at the beginning. Food chains, uh, kind of the old way of looking at it is a producer, then a primary consumer. So your, your producer might be grasses, your primary consumer might be a, a metal vole, a secondary consumer might be uh, the snake that ate the metal vole, a tertiary consumer might be the hawk that ate the snake that ate the metal vole that ate the grass. Um, but eventually there's something else that comes in there. What's the, what's missing from that food chain? A second. There's something that affects all of them. Decomposers. Very Decomposers. Good. Very good. Uh, and then a food web is really just a combination of food chains uh, that form a network. So you've got, you know, you've got your primary producers and the plants. Uh, 
primary produce, producers in some areas may be um, other things. You may have uh, bacteria that are working off of chemicals that are a primary producer in an environment where we don't get a lot of sunlight. Um, and they form a food chain off of that. But in Virginia, this is the, your plants are gonna be mostly your primary producers. So biodiversity, um, it's the number and variety and genetic variation of organisms within a geographic area. Uh, and I can share this presentation uh, with everybody. I'm not gonna go through and read it because we're getting short on time. Succession is a gradual replacement of one community by, of plants by another. So if you've got a field, you've got grasslands, you've got grass and shrub eventually grow in there. Um, birds might bring in seeds from other environments and then poop them out. Um, bears wandering through, leave scat behind that's got seeds in it. Um, a lot of our plants are actually adapted that the, in order for their seeds to germinate readily, they have to go through a digestive system of an animal. Uh, start growing up, seeded in from the edge. Uh, you'll get a pine forest or a mixed forest. Uh, and then you'll go up into our oak and hickory climax forest. Uh, Virginia pine is a real common one in this portion of the state uh, that you'll find in at field edges. And this actually, uh, the succession actually becomes important in wildlife management uh, because depending on what species you're managing for, such as woodcock or grouse, you want to change what uh, successional stage you're in. Uh, if you're, you know, you want forest edge, you want some open field. Uh, so you change that either through using chainsaws to remove trees, or uh, you might use wild, you might use controlled fire uh, to remove grasses and remove trees from fields. Um, but disturbances can be man-made or they can be natural, such as floods, tornadoes, and hurricanes. There's a whole list of different habitats. And again, I'll, I'll share this um, with you all. Let me ask, we've got about three minutes left. What questions do you all have? Does anybody have a a question that I can help address. As folks maybe are, are typing, um, I would like to let you know if you are interested in wildlife, there is a um, another training coming up next week that's virtual, that's usually in person in Culpeper called Woods and Wildlife. And it has a variety of uh, trainings in, uh, sessions, concurrent sessions and plenary sessions on wildlife and woods. So it's $25 a person, but if you, I'll send that out in the follow-up for coaches, if you're interested. Um, and that's a, uh, another option if you're interested in wildlife training too. I know it's online also, but that's where we are this year. Ah, important invasive species. Phragmites is a big one, specifically around uh, wetlands. Uh, I believe the full Latin name is Phragmites australis. Um, common reed is the common name for it, but most people know it as Phragmites. Uh, it grows in really dense, um, really dense areas, and it shades out and out competes with other native uh, species. Uh, so other important invasive species, Mo most of them are plants, uh, but then we get into some, one of the most common, one of the ones you might hear about in Virginia nowadays is a uh, spotted lantern fly, uh, which has come in and 
uh, it, it's a very, very damaging pest to our fruit trees. Uh, another one is emerald ash borer, uh, which attacks our ash trees. Uh, if you're up in the Blue Ridge in an area where you get hemlock trees, there's the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is another insect, the scale insect, um, common nickname for it is woolly booger. Um, it'll be on the underside of the vegetation and it makes a little fuzzy um, white cap that covers its body. Other plant species, uh, well, actually another big uh, one that we have that's a, a, it's an animal is a, the northern snakehead, which is an invasive species brought in from Asia. Uh, they're whole lots of ugly, uh, lots of teeth, lots of slime on them. The world record for northern snakehead was actually caught in Stafford County, Virginia. Uh, about 18 pounds, seven ounces. Um, I think one close to 19 pounds was caught recently as well. Uh, one was in Potomac Creek and the other one in Aquia Creek. Uh, so that, that's uh, kind of one of the things when you look at it is, is that invasive species doesn't really have a lot of natural predators. And so it's growing larger here in Virginia than it does in its home range in Asia. So. It's kind of where we're at. Um, we got about 40 seconds left. Any last questions? I am not seeing any, but I will go ahead and save our chat so that we will be able to send out the link that Ranger Sam put in the chat box for everybody. So. And I, I hope this was useful for everybody. And good luck. Thank you, Sam. We appreciate it. It's your first time. It was, I really learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs>